brief introduction of the three panelists up here. Um, Basim Razouk uh, is MD and FAAP, the medical director of the Pediatric Hematology, Oncology, and Pediatric Hospice at Peyton Manning Children's Hospital at St. Vincent in Indianapolis. Uh, he's a member of the Children's Oncology Group, Myeloid Committee, and is a member of the ACCC Advisory Board for Improving Quality Care in Small Population Cancers, specifically the uh, APL program. Previously, he was on the faculty at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, had a special interest in clinical research on APL, AML, and ALL in pediatric adolescent and young adults and he has more than 85 peer-reviewed publications. He earned his MD degree from American University of Beirut and completed a pediatric residency at SUNY Health Science Center at Syracuse, serving the last year as his chief resident. And he completed his pediatric uh, Hemonc Fellowship at St. Jude. Uh, uh, Hyatt uh, Tracy degree, don't ask is managing partner at the Lancaster Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. DeGreen has a significant interest in breast and bronchogenetic, excuse me, carcinomas and clinical trials for these cancers. His BS degree from Gettysburg College and then masters in molecular biology from Temple. His medical degree from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. He served as chief intern at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach and completed a residency in internal medicine and fellowship in Hemonc at Penn State Milton Hershey Medical Center. Uh, Terry Sescon is an oncologist with uh, uh, the Reading Health System, formerly Berks Hematology Oncology Associates, and is the principal investigator for all the medical oncology clinical trials, including those from uh, Fox Chase Cancer Center, ECOG, um, NSABP, and various pharmaceutical trials. He's been the director of the Family Risk Assessment Program at Reading Hospital in West Reading, Pennsylvania. He received his medical degree from Hahnemann University Hospital in Philadelphia, and he's board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and medical oncology. Without further ado, gentlemen. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for everybody who is brave enough to stay here and listen to us and not go to the nice weather of outside. Why a pediatric oncologist is talking to you? Because APL, as you will hear in a little bit, occurs mostly in younger adults as compared to other subtypes of AML. I will discuss one of the drugs that's approved for relapse acute bromylocytic leukemia, which is arsenic trioxide, and a newly diagnosed APL because there is very interesting recent literature about that use. I do not have any relevant financial relations to disclose. So APL is a subtype of AML, which depending on the literature, anywhere from 4.8% to 10% of all AML cases, but it has a unique clinical presentation a unique morphologic presentation, unique uh, molecular and cytogenetic presentation, and a unique treatment, uh, different from other subtypes of AML. That's why we're talking about it. And as you can see in that survival curve down, that if you treat APL up till late 80s with the regular 7 plus 3 drugs, you get only 20 to 30 percent long-term survival when you use a vitamin A derivative, which is a differentiating agent, which is ATRA, and the Chinese were the first to use that, you can increase the survival, long-term survival, in 75% to 80%. And now, with use of arsenic trioxide, you can increase that further. So APL occurs at any age. But if you know the epidemiology of other AML subtypes, usually it increases steadily with age up till 60 years, and then at 60 years, there is exponential increase in a, with age, with most or like three-fourths of the cases of AML diagnosed in people above 60 years of age. In APL, it's the opposite. In fact, it's rare to be diagnosed below 10 years of age. There is a few, but above 10, the increase in diagnosis steadily increases with age, reaches a maximum 
or a peak at 55 years, and then, in fact, after 60, it decreases. So that's why it's a disease of young adults. Also, although it constitutes 10 to 15% of AML cases, so if you have 12,000 cases a year, you are expected to see, of AML, you are expected to see anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 cases a year of APL, so it's not very common. However, there is several populations, like the Latino, the Hispanic, the Asian population, where there's a predominance, or those of Italian and European descent. In areas of Italy, there is like 34%, one-third of all AML are APL. Patients present with a variable white blood cell count. There is one subvariant called the microgranular variant, which have high leukocytosis, usually can have leukocytosis or can have low counts sometimes. And then they exhibit a very characteristic life-threatening coagulopathy. They may present with excessive bruising, hemoptysis, melena, hematuria, hematemesis, but also they can present or very early on have fatal pulmonary and intracranial bleeding. That's why the if you don't take any message from my go from my talk except APL can be associated with life it is a life threatening medical emergency and you need to initiate you need to diagnose very quickly you need to initiate treatment very quickly and you need to manage the complications promptly and immediately the lab findings are also characteristic you have usually moderate thrombocytopenia can range from 1000 to less than 50000 prolonged coagulation profile, the PT, the PTT, and low fibrinogen, so a picture of the IC, and increased fibrin split products. The presumptive diagnosis can be made by review of the blood smear alone. If you are a very good hematologist or hematopathologist, you can even make the diagnosis or presume the diagnosis even without looking at the smear sometimes. I mean, if you see the young age, the typical presentation, the bleeding, you suspecting leukemia, you have the abnormal labs we talked about. That's why a bone marrow aspirate and biopsy may not be needed. There are now several cases in the literature where they say you may not need to do a bone marrow aspirate or biopsy, although we like to as hematologists. But the take home message, you don't need to confirm the diagnosis by molecular or cytogenetic features to start treatment. So, the promyelocytes have typical presentation, as I will show you in the later slides. You have usually abnormal primary granules. You have what we all learned in medical schools, the our rods, and a group of our rods called phagot cells, so they're in bundle. And more than 30% abnormal promyelocytes in the bone marrow, which if you do the old immunostaining, they are positive for myeloperoxidase. The next few slides, this is a peripheral blood. You will see several abnormal promyelocytes. You don't see our rod for sure, but you see those large primary granules. This is a regular band, and these are three or four abnormal promyelocytes. If you do a bone marrow, you see very abnormal promyelocytes, and with one of those promyelocytes is those primary granules which are arranged as our rods and a bundle of our rods. And this is a pathognomonic, clinically and morphologically, of acute promyelocytic leukemia. However, to carry the diagnosis further, you can do flow cytometry. Not many people here may be hematopathologists, but what you do, you spin the cells, and this is the group of the cells which are malignant, called the flare, and you do several stains, and these are myeloid stains, CD13 and CD33 positive, which are uh, flow antigens, which are positive in all cases of AML, not the minor, uh, monocytic ones. But specifically, the promyelocytes have something called HLADR negative, usually. So if you have a hematopathologist, you can get this testing on the bone marrow, or if you have enough abnormal promyelocytes on the, SME, on the peripheral blood in four to six hours. You want to carry it further, you can do the cytogenetics. More than 95% of patients have the characteristic 15-17 translocation, 
and it encodes the PML fusion from chromosome 15 with the RAR alpha, which is the retinoic acid receptor. That's why retinoic acid works, the gene fusion product in most cases. However, karyotype, as you know, is time consuming, usually takes in many places seven to 14 days to come back, and there is a lot of false negative because those cells need to go into culture and be cultured, and sometimes it fails. The European Italian lab have around several years ago started a rapid testing, which in community centers, it may be good to talk to your pathologist to get, because an immunofluorescent testing, which tests against the PML and have a characteristic speculative pattern. This you can do on a slide of the peripheral blood or a slide of the bone marrow, both biopsy or aspirate, and it's a rapid, low-cost method which targets the protein. It's not targeting the RNA or DNA, but it's a quick round, a turnaround time of around four hours. Fish, which is an example shown there, and this is a dual color fish, where you have showing that in the patient there is a mixture of the 15 and 17, the fusion. It targets the DNA, is specific, rapid, but has a poor sensitivity. The one test, which is the molecular, which takes seven to 14 days sometimes, or five days to come back, which targets the RNA, is rapid and specific, but it's expensive and prone to artifacts. You have very high sensitivity, so you may detect cases which are not there. What is the treatment principles? My main message of this talk is that APL is a medical emergency. Even if you have a whiff of the diagnosis of APL, or you think about it, or you imagine it's there, start treatment with all transretinoic acid. All transretinoic acid work on the RAR alpha receptor, and it causes differentiation of the promyelocytes, not kill them, it causes apoptosis, and we'll talk about the mechanism of action, because it can decrease the coagulopathy. So that's why it's important to start even without waiting for the bone marrow examination. In some cases, ATRA is, after all, a high doses of vitamin A. It's innocuous. It's a little bit expensive, as I will tell you, on the cost, but nothing compared to the other drugs we use. It can be life-saving. And if the diagnosis does not come back to be APL, you can stop it in three to four days after you stabilize the patient. So initiation also of aggressive supportive care. This is where you need to contact your blood bank. You need to do labs sometimes every three hours, every four hours to monitor the PT, the PTT, and the platelet count and the fibrinogen. Mostly you need to keep the platelets above 50 and the fibrinogen above 100 to 150. And as hematologists, we usually like to conserve blood products. This is one of the rare instances where we tell you transuse liberal really, to transfuse with the platelets, with back red blood cells, rarely you need that, and transfuse with uh, cryoprecipitate uh, and fresh frozen plasma. While you're doing that, you can submit your peripheral blood and bone marrow sample to a reference lab for genetic confirmation of the disease to see if the 1517 translocation is there or the fusion product. Why we're talking about doing this? and not waiting for the diagnosis to be confirmed. Because early death rate, which is death rate in the first 30 days, is very high, mostly due to bleeding. In most clinical trials, it's nine to 10%. But this does not account to all the patients who make it, because many patients die before they go on clinical trial. So if you really do population studies, in New York they did a population study, it was 17.4%. In some places, it's as high as 28 or 30%. And unfortunately, even with ATRA, the population death rate did not decrease much. And why? Because many people wait for the diagnosis to be confirmed, and also the patient to be sent from the emergency department to the ICU, from the internal medicine, the nurses. So really, we need to educate everybody. And there is a practice guidelines on the ACC website that we as an advisory group started, and we'll talk about it in a minute. So most importantly is to decrease this death rate. And the part of this death rate is not only from bleeding, but the bleeding constitutes 70 to 80% of those deaths. The risk factors for bleeding are older patients, 
patients who have higher white blood cell count and patients with low platelet. That's why the transfusion is important. And intracranial hemorrhage followed by intrapulmonary and GI hemorrhage is the most common. But intracranial can be fatal and occur in 65 to 80% of cases. APL patients are also at increase for thrombosis because of the pro-coagulancy from cancer and increase in fibrinolysis inhibitors. But usually thrombosis is not as much fatal as bleeding. But that's why there is an interplay of factor there and it's more complex than you think. Coagulopathy usually resolves within four to six days after initiation of ETRA. That's why it's important to start early. So what's ETRA? This is provided by our pharmacist. Uh, the medication is called Vecinoid. It's there are several generics. Roche is the main manufacturer. Average wholesale price in our hospital is $29.88 per 10 milligram capsule. And on average, it's 45 per meter square per day. So let's say 90 milligram, you need nine capsule, make the math, $270 per day. Not bad compared to the other chemotherapy drugs that we use, but not cheap either. It induces differentiation and apoptosis in the leukemic promyelocytes by targeting the gene fusion at the R, RAR alpha receptor on chromosome 17. These are some practical things how to administer it. You administer it with a meal to help with nausea and enhance absorption. No, not to crush it, although in patients who come sick and intubated, you can administer it with seaflower oil and in an NG tube, although it's kind of cumbersome to prepare, but sometimes in those patients they cannot swallow and you cannot give them oral medication, you can use that. The most common adverse effects are headache, which is a pseudotumor cerebri, which is more common in younger people and children. That's why in children we use 25 milligram per meter square, not 45, lower dose. Arthralgia, bone pain, nausea, and vomit. So nothing major, however, in many patients, APL differentiation syndrome can happen even before you start ETRA, mostly in patients with high white cell count. However, ETRA can increase that, and it is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema with all those symptoms there, fever, acute respiratory distress, weight gain, pulmonary infiltrate, pleural pericardial effusion, and it's thought to be secondary to capillary leak syndrome from the effect of material or cytokines that's secreted by the malignant promyelocytes. Drug interactions as always increase the concentration of atrite, so you have to be careful if the patient is on any antifungals, voriconazole, fluconazole, all those compounds. In patients who have low white cell count, these are called low or intermediate risk patients, you start atra alone for one to three days to stabilize the coagulopathy and then you add the chemotherapy, which is anthracycline. Unless the white blood cell count is rising rapidly, then you add anthracycline. Hopefully by that time you confirm your diagnosis and AMF. However, in patients presenting with high risk disease, and those are the patients who are at increased risk for bleeding, you need to get, have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with your pathologist and say, is this AML? If this is AML, even if it's not APL, you may need to start ETRA as well as an anthracycline because the anthracycline have helped decrease the counts and decrease the risk of death from APL. So before you wait for cytogenetics or molecular studies, if you know this is AML, you don't want to give anthracycline to somebody who does not have leukemia, obviously, but if you know this is AML, giving that first dose of anthracycline can help save the patient. If you have any suspicion of APL differentiation syndrome, start dexamethasone. Many centers now, and I advise that in community centers, and it's, mentioned, it's not mentioned in our practice guidelines, but if you think a patient is at high risk, with high white cell count, elderly, it's not a bad idea to start the dexamethasone along with the ETRA as a prophylactic for the first 15 days, because that's most of the deaths occur in the first week, and then the second week, third and fourth week, the death rate usually decreases. 
Benefits of heparin and antifibrinolytic therapy remains questionable and should not be used routinely outside the context of a clinical trial. Leukophoresis is now banished. You may be uh, tempted to remove the white blood cells from somebody who present with a white cell count of 150,000. However, leukophoresis have shown, unlike other subtypes of AML, that it can cause the bleeding and the coagulopathy to be worse and can cause precipitate death. Delayed administration of ATRA. So you say, do you have any data to suggest to tell me start ATRA early? This is a retrospective study by Dr. Altman, but can prove the point. In those patients, and she had, I think, 204 consecutive APL patients, the early death rate was less in a patients who were started ATRA on day zero, one, or two, especially in the high risk patients. If ATRA was ordered the day APL was suspected, the death rate was less. However, unfortunately, ATRA was not ordered the day APL was suspected, except in less than one third of the patients. So she took the high risk patients, and in that, the early death rate was 80% if you waited three or four days to start ATRA, versus 18 or 20% for those who were started on the day off, or day one, or day two. So now you have data to tell you if you start ATRA early, you can decrease the death rate. But that's not the whole story. You still need the blood products. You still need to be very keen about the APL differentiation system. Our practice guidelines are available at the ACC website. There is a link there. And some of that tell you to make sure you have ATRA available in the hospital, available on the formulary. Maybe the emergency physician even need to, to get that. It's available or you can get it right away. Also, avoid any unnecessary procedures can increase bleeding. You may not need a bone marrow biopsy in those patients, unlike other subtypes of APL, of AMA, because you can make the diagnosis only with the aspect. Also, no need to put a central line, no lumbar puncture at diagnosis. They have very low risk of CNS disease at diagnosis and other procedures that can cause bleeding. So with current therapy, around 90 to 95% of patients with ATRA and chemotherapy achieve complete remission. Long-term cure rates are in excess of 80%. 15% of the 20% gap is mostly from early death rate and death and remission. Only 4 to 5% is from relapse. So relapse is not an issue. Treatment includes ATRA in the three phases, induction and consolidation. Maintenance is the controversial. In the European studies, they use maintenance. Not all American studies use maintenance, but ATRA is a major portion. However, there is a new player now, is arsenic trioxide. And it's very tempting to use it, especially in elderly patients or in patients with therapy-related APL, secondary APL, who have received a lot of anthracyclines because arsenic trioxide have less hematologic toxicities and less cardiotoxicity. And there is two studies, one from the North American group where arsenic was used in consolidation and the, inv the event-free survival was higher by 17 percentage point. And a new study in January of 2013 or February, I think, came from Europe and that's a New England Journal of Medicine where they used arsenic trioxide and ATRA and did not use chemotherapy, and the outcome was non-inferior, in fact, was even better, but that's only in the intermediate risky group, and that's short-term survival. ATRA, uh, ATO is being used as a single agent for induction and consolidation treatment now in many institutions in the U.S. and also in low-income countries because it's more available and in fact, in China, they're working on an oral formulation. So there may come a day in the next two, three years where you can treat APL with oral chemo only, like CML, without using IV chemo. And the last slide I have is about arsenic trioxide. And the brand name is Trizinox by Tiva Pharmaceuticals. It's $470 per 10 milligram vial, so it's not very, very expensive, and the dose is 0.15 milligram per kilo per day, five days a week. 
usually for four to five weeks. However, arsenic trioxide can cause APL differentiation, and also one of the major side effects is the transaminitis, but one of the serious side effects is prolongation of the QTC interval, so you want to make sure your electrolytes is normal and you need to monitor your cardiac EKG. Uh, other adverse effects are fatigue, GI exit, hyperglycemia, headache, dizziness, and abnormal liver function tests. These are all the list of references I mentioned. I don't know if we have time for one or two questions. Otherwise, keep your questions till the end. Thank you. Hi, I'm Terry Sescon. How many doctors are in the audience? So we got a couple. So unfortunately, most of our talks here are sort of more based as being doctors for doctors, so I apologize. And there's a lot of drugs that I'm gonna be talking about with CML, um, in particular one that our pharmaceutical people uh, know well. Um, so when I was in training, when I was in training a long time ago, our professors told us that people with CML would live a couple of years and then die. And then when I was in my fellowship, the treatment was with interferon followed by an allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And I still have patients alive today who had allogeneic bone marrow transplants. And I still have patients alive today who were treated with interferon and then moved on. And what they moved on to was Gleevec. And Gleevec initially was studied as a great drug in those who were failing interferon and then was found to be superior to interferon. Now when we have patients who are on Gleevec, they all complain about the side effects as well as all the other drugs. And I always remind them, well, you can always get interferon like we used to. Interferons, of course, are terrible you know, as far as toxicity is concerned, causing fevers, myalgias, depression, anorexia. And when these drugs started coming out, they made a, an absolute revolution. Now you can debate the actual response rates and et cetera, but when Gleevec came out, imatinib, it revolutionized the treatment of CML. The problem is you have to take this medication forever. And very similar to all transretinoic acid, or ATRA, it actually acts molecularly to reverse the abnormality. And it puts people into remission much of the time and keeps them that way, depending on how advanced their disease is. But now we have almost innumerable of these agents, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or TKIs. So along came another one called desatinib, and desatinib is a, a fairly effective drug, but in my experience has been unacceptably toxic fairly frequently. And it has been studied compared with the matinib. And just to point out that at one time, uh, imatinib or Gleevec, as the brand name was originally, was used at higher doses by some people, particularly at MD Anderson, and they tried pushing the dose up to 800 milligrams rather than the sta standard 400, and they did get higher response rates. Uh, Desatinib has faster and deeper responses, but there's no clear evidence of overall survival benefit in upfront treatment. Uh, both of these drugs are, are ineffective against a particular mut mutation, the T315i, uh, but there are many other mutations that can occur at the active site that desatinib is effective against, but imatinib is not. So as second line, they actually compared it to the high dose of imatinib that the people at MD Anderson were using and they found it was clearly superior, and it also is superior in accelerated phase and blast crisis. So desatinib is around, uh, the brand name I think is Sprycell, and uh, it's, a, it's a reasonably good agent, uh, let me just go back, but the problem with desatinib that I've seen numerous times, unfortunately, is fluid retention, uh, heart failure, and I've had a lot of people not tolerate it from that standpoint. And along came nilotinib, and the brand name is Tisigna. And I found that Tisigna, in general, doesn't have that kind of an issue with the, the, the fluid retention. 
Um, it does have, obviously, a better, higher response rate, again, like dasatinib does, compared with the original drug, Gleevec or Imatinib. But again, not significant, you know, overall survival benefit. It is clearly an excellent drug when there's more advanced disease, like accelerated phase or blast phase CML. And like I said, it has less fluid retention. But it does have QT prolongation, which can be an issue. And if you don't want people to get into uh, dangerous arrhythmias, you really should follow their EKG. And here's one thing that was very interesting. I had a patient who was actually being seen at Hershey. And one of the guys at Hershey was seeing this gentleman and was, it was driving him crazy. He could not get this guy's transcripts of the abnormality, the BCR Abelson gene rearrangement to go away. And he switched him to dasatinib and the guy didn't tolerate it. He got you know, the, the fluid retention. And he switched him to dunlotinib and it didn't work. And in fact, his transcripts were rising. And the guy came to me for a second opinion and I looked at his list of drugs and there he was on Prevacid. So if you give somebody a proton pump inhibitor, which knocks out your acid production, or for that matter, if you give them ranitidine, or if you're really old, give them tagamet, cimetidine, uh, you'll knock out the acid and it won't be absorbed. And, and we actually had the guy start to take his nilotinib with a soda, because almost any soda has acidity, and it fostered absorption, and it worked. And his transcripts went away, and he's a happy camper now. Um, in molecular remission. So uh, more drugs have come along, and these drugs are good drugs, and I would argue that the, the newer incarnations are probably eventually going to be found to, to lead to an overall survival benefit over the initial imatinib or Gleevec, as the brand name was. Um, However, at this time, we still don't have clear data from an overall survival benefit that they are better. Um, you get uh, basutinib, you get great responses, and you know, it seems to be less toxic than dasatinib, uh, no QT prolongation. But again, it's not obviously superior to the others in first-line treatment. Uh, this, this agent um, is a, a new drug that does have some liver enzyme abnormalities, liver toxicity, pancreatitis, some fluid retention, some risk of thrombosis, but these are actually fairly low numbers, and uh, it has similar responses and resistant uh, of uh, disease where it's not responding to imatinib, and those who are intolerant of imatinib uh, but it also works on that one mutation, which um, in the past we had no options for. So this, this is a really great drug. So basically where we're coming from now was not that long ago, 25 years ago, everybody was going to die unless they had a bone marrow transplant, to now more and more people with more and more options are going to live for a prolonged period of time. One of the issues, though, is how long do you treat somebody? And as far as we know now, it, the data really suggests you should stay lifelong on treatment. There have been people who have gone off treatment and who have stayed in remission. And the nice thing about it is you can follow and see if their transcripts become detectable. You can do bone marrows, et cetera, if you need to. Uh, we do still recommend initially getting a bone marrow biopsy. And Probably part of the reason is you want to make sure that you're getting cytogenetics, that they don't have just one, uh, if they have another mutation, something else going on, rather than just CML, then you may have blast crisis that's evolving. You can do these scoring uh, categories that actually will give you better data as far as the risk is concerned. Uh, for low risk, you can still use, you know, imatinib, dasatinib, nilotinib. Uh, but there's another issue that comes about, and we see this all the time, unfortunately, is that some of the drug costs get to be a problem for some of the individuals. Now, you can talk to the gentleman who's back there about the cost of his new drug, but imatinib is typically something that our insurance companies will allow us to get because it's first line, it's generic now, and they'll pay for it because it's less expensive in general. One of the problems that we do run into 
is that some of our insurance companies are following NCCN guidelines, and we just ran into this interesting situation where a guy who didn't tolerate imatinib at one point and was switched to desatinib and then nilotinib and decided he wanted to go back to imatinib again because he was getting the same sort of myalgias and arthralgias with each drug. And he said, well, why don't I go to the cheapest drug? They're all working. They all cause the same pain. And the insurance company wouldn't pay for it because somebody was reading the NCCN guidelines like it was you know, set in stone, like the Ten Commandments, and that you couldn't move on to imatinib if you've had these other drugs because he's got resistant disease. I actually had to call them up and write a letter and tell them, no, this guy does not have resistant disease. It's because of intolerance. But monitoring is absolutely key. NCCN guidelines. Uh, you really want to have a com complete cytogenetic remission in 12 months, and you actually want to see transcripts go away, preferably three log reduction very, fairly quickly. Um, and what you hope to see is that the people stay in remission. Interestingly, if you have some low-level transcripts of the abnormality, a lot of these patients continue to do well for a long time. And we don't see many people progressing through once they're on the drugs for a prolonged period of time, it seems like they continue to do well, which is a beautiful thing. CML has come a long way. Thank you. Any questions? Mm-hmm. What is the magic marker that segregates those patients? And I don't think anyone knows that answer. And my concern is that, you know, first of all, you're going to be following these people and, and, and following their, their, you know, initially PCR, and then if, if they get enough logs, you'll probably go to fish. And you may want to repeat a bone marrow on them at some time. But my concern is that this patient is relapsing with their CML if the transcripts are rising and they're going to get into trouble. Uh, there are selected patients rarely where it doesn't seem to come back. The problem is how do you pick them? Nobody knows. And, and we're stuck with this situation where it makes me as a clinician very uncomfortable when I have a, a relatively well-tolerated you know, not just one drug, but innumerable drugs now that you can switch from one to the other. It's, it's, we have more drugs for CML than we have, you know, hormone agents for breast cancer now, you know, and we thought we had a glut, you know, when, when letrozole and, you know, exemestane came out. So it, it's really neat. So we can try from one drug to the other to the other. And, and, you know, if it's intolerance, that is the problem. But it, it is a very scary thing as a clinician to see somebody who decides to go off of it. Recently, I had a gentleman, and this is a very rare situation, who, of course, didn't tell me, but went off of his, he was on imatinib and went off of it without telling me for several months and developed um, leptomeningeal disease. And, you know, he, he died from leptomeningeal disease which was the strangest thing. It was, it was actually reportable. I should have written it up, but I never got around to it because I'm too busy. Uh, and I, I've seen numerous other patients who go off of it for a while and their transcripts rise, and then you just put them back on it and they come back down again. So the neat thing is you can follow their transcripts, and, and I would probably follow their transcripts every two or three months rather than you know, at a more prolonged uh, period of time, which you may have trouble with with the insurance company. I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, DeGreen? He, he, um, spoke to a question. Uh, yes, sir. You mentioned that, I guess, nilotinib is the one that requires stomach acid mm -hmm. to be absorbed. But you know, that might be a reason why people on that drug, their transcripts might rise. But do people ever biologically, truly you know, come off of a matinib because of uh, intolerance, switch to one of the other drugs, and then fail to respond to those? I mean, I have a number of patients who That would be extremely unusual. 
because now, you know, now you've got drugs that are actually, if anything, you could argue more effective uh, with you know, greater binding affinity and greater range of efficacy to you know, mutants. You know, so it's, it's much less likely you're going to get into trouble by switching to one of the newer agents. So I, I wouldn't see it really as being a problem. The, the trick is to get experience with the other drugs. And we have a fair amount of experience with the satinib and nilotinib. The newer agents, we don't have that much experience with. Um, but as we get more experience, we'll probably you know, be happy to switch people to you know, you know, one of five drugs or six drugs or however many drugs you know, come out. Yes, sir. You mean Homo herringtonone or Oma X? You know, it's, it's, I think because we now have a drug for the T315I, it's probably a dead drug. You know. Yeah. Yeah, an old MD Anderson drug that, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like Listerine antiseptic. It's looking for a treatment. Maybe it works for, you know, bad breath. I don't know. But, uh, um, you know, fortunately, I, I think. We've got better drugs. We've got oral TKIs. We've got a new oral TKI that uh, is effective under those circumstances and also effective in pretty much all circumstances of CML. So, you know, it's, it's a great thing. It's really cool. And we won't, the other thing is we won't be seeing people getting transplanted very much anymore. I mean, they used to all get transplanted. I have a guy who had an, uh, an unrelated transplant at uh, Hutchinson, you know, Fred Hutchinson, and has chronic GVH, you know, ever since then, and he's never worked a day since then. You know, he looks fine, but he's got, you know, Sjogren's syndrome, it looks like. You know, he's miserable. Okay, thank you. Oh, one more. One more question, Dr. Susan. You mentioned Lebeck uh, is being married. I was under the impression that he was married in 15. And Matinib is already generic. It's generic now. Yeah. No, I, I believe it Lebeck, is. Lebeck, I believe, I may be wrong. I In 115, you said? Oh. I'll have to look into that. I, thought it was it. Generic, I, believe, I believe it was already generic. Yeah. The, big, the biggest, to Dr. Sescon, is the hardest part, not just being a prior practitioner, but being previous university, was you get, not bombarded, but you get presented with these new TKIs that are more efficacious, less side effects, but they've been in remission for so long on a matinee that I personally have had a very hard time stopping the medication if they've been stable, no side effects, moving on to new generation, second generation, third generation, because they've been so stable. And that's been my greatest obstacle to move beyond that. There would be stable. no reason to, to right. change that person. You know. then some, but, and, and some do, as you know. Yeah, they just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are many of my partners feel that you should start the other drugs you know, up front mm -hmm. because of higher response rates deeper, you know, drops in the transcripts, et cetera. But, you know, and, and maybe they're right, you know. Maybe that's going to translate if you studied enough patients to overall survival benefit. At this time, we can't say that. And, you know, people do pretty well with imatinib. They really so it's, it, it's a debate in my mind. Dr. Degree. I have a 42-year-old woman that has been on Gleevec for seven years now. Um, no disease. We reached um, complete molecular remission within f six months, and I'm not willing to stop her. Her biggest side effect is she's had some skin reaction. Um, she's had mild uh, pneumonitis that was easily palliated with a reduction in some steroids, but um, those kind of patients I refuse to, to change because they've done so well. Um, thank you for the talk. Listen, I'm, I'm speaking about palliative care, which is um, a very broad topic, and they want me to talk about it in myeloma patients. I argue that this is well beyond myeloma. Um, and you can look at um, simply known that myeloma patients, not just myeloma, but other hematologic malignancies, they're living longer. Um, if you look at UK data, um, British Columbia data, U.S. data, the median seven plus years in younger populations that respond up front. So you're not just dealing with, with adverse reactions from the, from the um, 
disease, but from the therapy for the disease. And the pain from the myeloma is quite significant. 65% of patients on presentation will have significant pain, debilitating pain upon presentation while you treat these patients and get them into hopeful remission or very good partial response. I mean, they will also develop significant side effects from the medications you give them, whether it be single agent Zelvelcate or Revvelcate or dexamethasone could be terrible on patients with anxiety and sleeplessness and um, it, it, the list goes on. Um, if you look back in the British Journal of Hematology in July of 11, I believe, they talk about NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence Guideline for myeloma. They talk about BCSH, the British Committee for Standards and Hematology Guidelines for Diagnosing and Management of Myeloma. They look at the WHO that constantly is rearranging its, its um, um, guideline on how to manage a typical, quote, typical, how do you define typical patient with these, with these adverse drug reactions or reactions from the, from the uh, disease itself. And I really argue that there's no standard that has been, that has been documented to be better than the other. So my, in this brief discussion, my talk is more of a, um, how, is, how, is, how many people here take care of myeloma patients on a regular basis? Okay, so you guys all know the, um, whether they go through autologous non-ablative non transplants, full ablatives are very rare that I see these days. The, the, the toxicities are much less so of the disease now than they are of the drugs, unless you li they live 7, 10, 12 years on therapy, then they get the neuropathies, they get the, the pain that you cannot control very easily. Um, many times um, we will think that as hematologists we can take care of it, and that is just simply not true. We need the support of others that can maybe help guide us and help them better. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to manage pain control, how to do stimulants, how to... Um, can we go to the next one, please? Next slide. I'm not going to talk about stimulants. We all know about Ritalin and its effect on chemotherapy or disease-induced fatigue. Um, um, pain control, we all uh, have done pain control before, but it wasn't until I took time in palliative care, which I, I just nearly suffered boards for, that I knew that you could increase long-acting pain medication 50% every 12 hours until you have pain control, that your total Breakthrough dose should be 10% of your total daily dosing. Um, these are things that you will not learn unless you're taught by somebody you manage in just pain management. Um, psychosocial, that is a huge topic to talk about, and we'll get into that in a second. And strength, of course, comes from not just mental, but physical. So I come up with this mnemonic cancer that I've used several times in different talks, and you can, you can you know, change the, the mnemonic will stay the same, but you can use different words for C, like community, community, compassionate care. Have we exhausted what we have in the community? I mean, have we worked on finding them social support, whether it be um, nonprofit? Our, our center has a very, very nice nonprofit side that focuses on um, not just pain, but emotional support. Um, most, of the, um, most of the benefits I've seen from, from, for patients is from their peers. Uh, their disease might, might be unique to them, but their fears and their symptoms are not. And the best way to learn is from your peers. And some of these support groups are, are, are really crucial in their, in their therapy. Have we exhausted the fact that we have hospice support? People look at hospice as, quote, giving up, and that's just not the case. I mean, back in the day before they had hospice, we as oncologists, hematologists, were doing all this, all this type of care while they were in the hospital. Now we have wonderful assets to use them at home as an extra set of eyes. Are we utilizing their support groups and their, and their expertise? And many times they are much better than we are at managing and these symptoms. Um, a and N, we put, we, I can put together. I mean, is therapy appropriate and is it necessary, really? I mean, these patients come to you, um, they talk, you know, I still have colleagues that I've worked with in the past or work with now that, you know, you're a myeloma patient, you get transplanted. That's it. You go through a transplant, that, that's the goal to get them there. I argue in the future, is that really going to be a standard of care for these patients? Um, and I certainly am not a transplant specialist, so I don't want to step on any toes in that one. But, I mean, we treat these patients with proteasome inhibitors now, with, with IMIDs, um, the steroids, uh, the, the anthracycline days, I don't use too much anymore. But the newer regimens coming out can really 
you know, prolong their lives, but when you get to a point where, okay, I'm gonna give you the, the new, the Kyprolis as a single agent, um, which many of us use with oral cytoxin or other medications, try to bring them back into remission or very good responses, is that going to prolong your life enough and give you a good quality of life? Is it really worth it? Or should we just do a palliative route? Should we decide just to take care of the pain? And many times these patients will live longer than giving them medications that might give them an extra month or two of life um, or an extra month of progression-free survival. Um, so that, that's a very difficult decision, and that's, that's the art of medicine. Should the hematologist say, you know, I've done my best, I could offer you this drug, give them the data, but if you have a 5% chance of responding, is it gonna be a worthwhile response? That's the hardest question for any hematologist, nurse practitioner, manager, nurse navigator, to help somebody make. Very difficult, in my opinion. Commitment, this is very personal to us who treat not just in academics or in private practice, but just treat patients as a general rule. When you personally, when you bring a patient on, if you're gonna give them medications that's, that, that is toxic, life-threatening medications, you better darn well be there for them when they call you at two in the morning for an adverse event. That's my opinion. If you take them on, say, I'm gonna help you with your pain and your disease, you're committing to that patient. So not every question has to, has to be answered in an office visit. You know, in my opinion, take that patient and their family as an extension of not just treating that one person, but everybody who loves them. And if they have questions, don't limit it to a 15-minute slot in your, in your office setting to answer them. Call them on their own time, on their own turf. That does nothing, in my opinion. I've never had a bad outcome from that. Some will abuse that privilege, but that's really the rare. That's rare. They'll come out of that with more confidence in you, their therapy, willing to accept therapy, um, and they, you've, you've shown them that you're committed not just to what you know, they can come see you in an office visit for, but you're going to make them feel better, whether it be one year of life, three years of life, or I have patients that are 10 years out in their mind on the therapy right now. So the commitment is huge to me. Engage and educate patients. This is, um, I have patients who say, Dr. DeGreen, just make me feel better. That's fine, that's what they want to do. So I say, I'll do my best. And I give them medications they want, I'll take care of their pain. Um, but I encourage at all times for patients to educate themselves. You've, we've all had patients come in with stacks from the web of you know, papers that say, you know, I've read this fad diet about asparagus and baking soda that'll cure cancer and eat blueberries three times a day. I mean, so take that you know, with, some, you know, with all intents of, of um, helping the patient, but also guide them. I mean, some of these patients really will go off the deep end when it comes, quote, deep end, when it comes to trying to get additional information. But take, the, take it seriously, because sometimes I learn every day from patients what helps them. I learn more from patients than I learn from any book or any speaker that will ever talk to me. And that's daily. That's just not, that's, that's daily I learn that. So I really do encourage patients to educate themselves as much as they want to. And as a physician, we should be there to support their, their, their um, wish to, to self-educate on their, on their disease. And that many times will lead to them accepting therapy. The patients who do the best, I always tell them, are the ones that, say, that I say, you know, look, Mr. X, Mr., you know, you know, if you keep an open communication with me, tell me your thoughts, tell me what you've learned. Um, don't wait till our next visit. Give a phone call. They're the pe people who do the best because I can't fix the problem, help them fix their symptom, unless I know what's going on. And many times patients are so um, intimidated, is probably the best word, to call up a center and just talk to you and, and tell you what's going on with their, with their body. And the only way you're gonna be able to fix them or help them, fix is a bad word, but help them, is for them to feel that they can talk to you, not just on their visit, but any time during the day. If you have a good nursing staff, they can be triaged, and if you have a good nursing staff, they'll know when to come to you and they can't answer that question. So resources. You know, resources is a, a very, is a rather ambiguous term, but it goes back to community um, in a lot of ways. I mean, if, it, has the patient been offered all their resources? Have they been given consultations to a pain management specialist if you can't handle it? Many times we can't handle it. Have they been sent to psychotherapy? Have they talked to somebody who can help them work through their problems or help their family through these problems? 
Palliative care should not start when the patient has exhausted options of, of conventional care. It should start from the time they're diagnosed to the time after they die because you're not just taking care of that patient but their family, their loved ones. And even after death, for months, maybe years, their family is going to have a hard time coping with that, whether it's you, your center, or a referral to a place that can manage those problems. They deserve that. Um, so how have we exhausted those resources? Many times I send patients to, I have wonderful reports at uh, different universities around where I am, Penn, Hershey, um, Jefferson. You send these patients to get a transplant, but unless you follow up with them, sometimes I find that those, those backup resources, those, ne those necessary resources that these patients need after they're treated are lost. They're lost in follow-up. So you, I would encourage those that are sent away for transplants, sent away for experimental protocols, you follow up with them on a regular basis. Call their home, call their family. There's more to, there's more to palliative care than giving somebody a morphine drip. Um, so the, I used to put in there relinquish, and I, I still should put in there, that I tell patients to relinquish any thought that we have all the answers, that we don't. We still haven't figured them out. I doubt we ever will. Um, there are some docs, I'm sure we all work with, that you know, to do it all. They admit patients, they take care of every infectious problem, try to take care of all the pain. I'm the exact opposite. If I can't handle something, I refer to somebody who's better at it than me. And this is the way patients will, will, will survive longer. They'll have a better quality of life. Um, so I really encourage us as physicians to um, realize our limitations. And that's like the biggest problem I have with other colleagues, myself included, is knowing when to, when to punt and when to keep it you know, within my, my own roof. Um, there are plenty of sites that I can you know, easily give to you guys with regards to guidelines on how to manage pain, um, psychosocial support. I'm happy to give it to you but they're readily available. What I would, what I would warn is that, um, pa to warn patients to stay off of certain blogs. You know, they'll, they'll get online, they'll read about, you know, I, I took um, milk thistle and w whatever, whatever they took to make themselves feel better. These, are, these can be quite dangerous, but there are very good responsible sites that are mediated by physicians who manage this day in and day out that they can benefit from. So if you have any interest in those whatsoever, please come to me, I'll be happy to give them to you.